Uh, hey, I am very excited to be here and uh, at my first EMF camp. So thanks to everyone who's making this wonderful event happen. Uh, I often give technical talks at uh, events like this, and uh, this one is not technical. This one is just about uh, uh, my experiences starting an open source hardware company, Great Scott Gadgets. Uh, we make um, a number of things like uh, the Ubertooth, uh, which is a Bluetooth test tool, and HackRF, which is a software-defined radio platform, and a variety of other things that we're working on. And uh, I kind of uh, uh, didn't really think about the fact that I would be starting an open source hardware company uh, until it sort of happened. And I wanted to kind of tell the story and maybe uh, it would be helpful to people who uh, are thinking about making a similar leap uh, perhaps, but, uh, I, I don't, uh, I, sometimes folks ask me for advice about starting a business or something. And I, I say, well, you know, I, I don't know how much advice I have for you, but I can at least tell you how it went for me. And, uh, so that's what I'm doing. So, uh, my story or the year that I'm talking about starts in October of 2010 with TourCon 12. And, uh, this is a, an information security conference in San Diego. And I had kind of a busy year. It was the second time I taught my software defined radio class there. And I gave a couple of, of talks as well. Um, one of them was Ubertooth Zero, a preview. And I had designed this circuit board that was like the first, it was the first PCB I ever designed. And it was called Ubertooth Zero. It was deliberately named zero and not one because uh, I intended uh, I intended to replace it. Uh, it was just kind of a, an initial prototype uh, that could be made to demonstrate a Bluetooth sniffing function, uh, and in particular, kind of the the killer app of Ubertooth was that uh, it can detect and identify non-discoverable Bluetooth devices. And this was a capability that, uh, that had been missing before. It had not been possible to uh, detect non-discoverable Bluetooth devices uh, prior to this uh, without spending like $10,000 plus on test equipment. So uh, we were pretty, uh, I was pretty excited about it and, uh, and I wanted to show people what I was working on. And it was just a short uh, uh, work in progress kind of talk, but uh, when I was there and showing this to people, a, a lot of my friends in the information security community started asking me, when can I buy it in shops? And I, I was like, uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, like a, the originally when I started the Ubertooth project, I was trying to make something that people could make for themselves. Uh, I wanted it to be open source hardware, um, and, or, uh, pieced together from off the shelf hardware. And uh, it turned out that I ended up designing the thing kind of from scratch instead of piecing it together from other things. And so it turned out to be something that, that maybe would make, would make sense to manufacture for people. And so I started thinking about that and thinking about what it would take to manufacture this thing for people. And, uh, and this was all kind of a, a side project because I had a job uh, at the uh, at the Boulder Labs in Colorado doing uh, uh, wireless security research, and uh, you know that was a that was a pretty nice place to be. And I wasn't really looking to start a business; I just was looking to get this tool into the hands of people who could do something useful with it. So. Uh, but after TourCon, I started thinking seriously about starting a business and um, what that what would that would mean and how I could manage to do that on the side and and get this tool out to more people. Um, initially, uh, that meant I would start um, kind of redesigning or refining the Ubertooth Zero design and working toward Ubertooth One. And... Um, I found this talk uh, by Mitch Altman online, and Mitch, uh, I believe, is here somewhere. Um, so uh, if you're listening, thank you, Mitch, uh, because this talk um, that that he had given at some event not too long before this uh, was, had a video posted online, and I watched it, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Maybe I could, maybe I could do uh, this and kind of what he did, and um, follow in his footsteps 
starting a, a hardware company, building something uh, that uh, that I really enjoyed doing. And it's this talk in particular is full of more practical advice, I think, and uh, uh, probably more so than this talk today. Uh, so I would recommend it to you if you're interested in uh, pursuing a similar path. He's, uh, he had a couple of particular insights that I thought were very interesting. Uh, one was uh, don't do business with people you don't like, uh, which... <laughs> Uh, has been a, a guiding principle for me ever since, uh, and it's it's worked out pretty well. And he really got me thinking about how uh, the kind of the economics of um, of running a business and how I would do pricing, for example. So the pricing is something that um, was super important for me to be thinking about at that particular time. Uh, because I was figuring out what the what would be entailed in the product itself and what it would cost to build it and how I would actually sell it. And one of the things that I, I considered was a reseller model. And in particular, um, I, I considered uh, at least kind of three three different distribution models, one being, selling direct like have a website and sell direct to people and ship things individually to uh, so retail direct retail sales uh, another would be a a reseller model like a two-tier reseller model where i would sell to resellers and then they would do the retail sales and then the third would be a, a three-tier distribution model where i would sell to one or more distributors and then they would distribute things to resellers and they would sell them to other people and and i had uh, some background uh, working for companies in the in a three tier kind of channel before, so that sort of made sense to me. But I, but what didn't make sense was that this product was such a such a niche product that uh, I didn't really think that a, a, th a multi tier distribution model really made any sense. There were very few uh, retailers in the world who would likely be interested in carrying this product. So uh, since it would be a fairly small number of resellers, I thought it made the most sense to uh, to do the two-tier two -tier model where I would sell directly to resellers and then they would sell to the end users and do the retail sales. And that's been my model ever since. Um, and one of the important reasons that I did that instead of trying to sell direct, which you know is, is more possible these days and, uh, than it used to be, the one of the important considerations was that the uh, that I was trying to do this on the side. I had a day job, and I really wanted to minimize the amount of effort I had to do in order to make this a reality. My goal was just to put hardware in people's hands, uh, not necessarily to uh, you know make a growing company. Even though that later happened, the. Uh, and so I, I had a goal that I wanted to be, make this company a solo company. I didn't want to have to hire help. I didn't want to have to hire employees and so forth. I wanted it to be solo for as long as possible. And so uh, I looked for opportunities to kind of outsource different things. So, for example, manufacturing. I, I didn't do my own manufacturing. I outsourced that to a contract manufacturer. And then retail sales, I kind of outsourced that to resellers and so forth. And uh, around that time, I was uh, kind of getting excited about, well, hey, if I, if I, now that I know how to design circuit boards, um, it might be fun to design some other things too. And I had this thing called a throwing star land tap that I had made like 10 years previous, uh, that was made by splice together in e splicing together ethernet cables. And it was super useful. I used it all the time personally. And I, um, you know, I like doing system administration and network administration and security stuff. And, uh, I, uh, but one, one kind of frustrating thing about it is that whenever I would use it, I would have to use ethernet couplers like RJ 45 couplers. And so it ends up being a lot more unwieldy than it looks because of the couplers. And I thought, Hey, now that I know how to design circuit boards, I could change this design and make a make a circuit board and put install female connectors instead of have, having male plugs on the thing. And so I made the throwing star land tap and um, 
this was uh, a kit that I designed, but uh, at first I just started printing circuit boards and started handing them out as business cards. And, uh, and I still hand these out as business cards. The, um, uh, and I have some here, if, if, you know, if you see me around the camp, uh, hit me up for one. But uh, uh, I thought, well, if I'm, going to, if I'm going to have a company that sells a product, maybe I'll have two products. And, uh, and so I was looking into maybe manufacturing the Throwing Star Land Tap as a kit, uh, which I did end up doing later. And uh, that's, you know, a pretty easy manufacturing job since it's just making the PCBs and then grabbing a few components and sticking them in a bag. So uh, ShmooCon was in the following January and it was at the end of January. And this was uh, kind of a, a good timing for me because it was around, it was about the amount of time I needed to finish Ubertooth 1, which was the, the refined version of Ubertooth 0. And I gave this talk, uh, Project Ubertooth, Building a Better Bluetooth Adapter. And uh, it, was a, uh, it was a talk that was very much about the project of building Ubertooth and how I came to build Ubertooth and the challenges that I had, like learning electronics so that I could build Ubertooth and all about the, all about the Ubertooth project primarily from a technical standpoint. And so this talk today is actually kind of a sequel uh, to, to that talk. That was about the, the technical project that then led me to start Great Scott Gadgets. And so this talk is about how Great Scott Gadgets came to be. Um, and one of the things that I, I talked about in that talk is how I started Grace Scott Gadgets as a fake company uh, because I was just trying to social engineer uh, like part manufacturers. Um, I just wanted to try to get like free samples and data sheets and stuff. And um, like so I so I just sort of invented this company. The first name I thought of was Grace Scott Gadgets and I registered a domain name and put up a website and started sending emails from that domain and and started uh, uh, you know trying to hit up manufacturers for documentation and stuff and it totally did not work at all. Um, but uh, but I I started that and then when people started asking me later about like would I sell them Uber teeth I said uh, well you know I sort of have this company and uh, so uh, as an experiment uh, I decided to uh, take this design that I made uh, Uber tooth one uh, which really was this pretty much the same thing as Uber tooth zero just refined and uh, and I decided to to try to uh, go into business with it. And this is actually a slide, these are slides from that talk. And at the time, this slide was about, uh, about how I knew nothing about electronics and how I had to just start from nothing and learn electronics so that I could do the Ubertooth project. But it's also highly relevant to running a business because I really didn't know a whole lot about running a business either. And I made a very deliberate choice that if I were going to bother going into business to, to produce this thing, that my business would be dedicated to open source hardware. Um, that everything that I had ever done in my life that, uh, or anything I'd ever done in my career that I was proud of was something that I did with the help of open source software. And so for, to me, open source is just the right thing to do. And, um, and, but that was, for me, a, um, a very deliberate choice that that was one particular thing that I would not compromise on. Every other aspect of running a business, I knew nothing and I would admit that I was an idiot and just, you know, whatever, whatever I need to learn, I would try to learn and I would try to learn from my mistakes. And I think it was important to kind of have that uh, that mental clarity, that, that delineation between here's what I'm willing to, unwilling to compromise on. I am willing to compromise and learn on everything else. I don't want to have preconceived notions about how this is going to go. Um, and I, I think that was kind of helpful. Um, so I started using this thing called Kickstarter and it was kind of newish at the time. I had only heard about it during this period of time when people were asking me if they could buy Ubertooth. And so I put Ubertooth on Kickstarter and launched it uh, at the time of ShmooCon. Um, and it the funding goal was that green line across the, the screen there. And so like 
I announced that it was la- I launched it at, like on Saturday morning at ShmooCon, and then Monday morning it just took off, and uh, I think by Tuesday evening it was funded or something, and and uh, I thought it was kind of interesting how there it looks like if you look at the plot of the uh, of the pledges that came in for the Kickstarter campaign that uh, it was sort of exponential growth looking at first until about the time that it hit the pledge goal and then it was very linear after that um and that's a pretty common uh pretty common looking curve i've seen other other crowdfunded projects have kind of similar results they don't always look like this but uh it, it's a fairly common looking sort of thing uh, for uh successfully funded crowdfunded projects uh but and and it it kind of made me think a, a couple of things one was you know if I, if i had set the goal higher would it have been had a longer period of exponential growth like did i miss out on things um but i don't think that that was really the right conclusion to draw from this um i I've, I've later learned um uh that uh you know, setting setting a pledge goal is really a tricky thing, and uh, setting it high is not necessarily a good idea. Uh, but I did make a mistake here. Um, I set the goal at uh, sixteen thousand dollars, and it turned out that I really needed about twice that. And so, as it turned out, I did get more than twice that. So I was totally fine. But what if I had been funded at exactly sixteen thousand dollars? What if I had just barely met my pledge goal? I might have had real problems actually bringing this product to market. Uh, so I made a mistake here, but I got lucky anyway that I had enough funding to get past um, uh, what Nate from Spark Fund has called the pit of despair, which is that kind of middle ground where you. Uh, you have enough interest in your product to make it seem like you should be going into mass production, but you don't actually, actually don't have enough funding to achieve mass, mass production. So I got over that threshold despite the fact that I set my goal too low. I should have set it about double what I did just to have this, the uh, assurance that I wouldn't fall into the pit of despair. Um, one of the things that I did for my Kickstarter backers uh, was I said, hey, if you if you fund me at the highest pledge level, uh, then uh, you'll, I'll get give you a special edition Uber Tooth and that will come with some extra things like an enclosure and some antennas and stuff. And uh, uh, but I hadn't really figured out how I was going to make the special edition units. Like, would I make them separately or maybe they maybe they would just come out of the regular batch and then I would just add stuff to those packages. But I thought it would be nice if I actually had uh, them, uh, the PCBs look different. Uh, and so I thought about maybe making them myself on a hot plate, but I had to make 50 of them and that's a lot of work. Um, but meanwhile, um, some uh, uh, some folks from a company in Australia contacted me, contacted me, and they were really interested in um, uh, in having uh, kind of early access to uh, Uber Teeth, and they wanted uh, I can't remember ten or twenty something like that, and and they were um, uh, you know willing to pay extra to get them sooner, very soon. And I thought, well, you know, depending on how much they're willing to pay, maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe I could uh, kind of get them to pay for the special edition production. And I'll, I'll make a few for the Australians and I'll make the rest for the, uh, for the special edition people. And some or all of that special uh, small production costs would be paid for uh, by the Australians. And that seemed to kind of work out. Um, and we made, uh, and I, I hired a, a, a different manufacturer, not the one that I've been. So the, the manufacturer I had been talking to, uh, about manufacturing Uber tooth and, and that did manufacture Uber tooth was one that, uh, you know, I'd gotten referral to and, uh, was starting a relationship with and, but they, but it was brand new. I was, uh, you know, I was a first time customer, so they didn't want to add on this extra little, you know, 50 to a hundred unit production. Uh, they, so they want to do like a thousand unit production or more. And so, uh, I hired some like random PCB assembler in China to do the, uh, the white ones, which was this, which were the special editions. And I had, I had a hundred of them made and they, 
um, it was an, it was interesting uh, because uh, the, uh, the 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 CC forty uh, CC twenty four hundred um, this, this sort of came up during the special edition. Uh, the CC twenty four hundred is a chip that is on the Ubertooth, and it's like the essential chip that accomplishes the the Ubertooth function, and it was it was a part that uh, I. I, a couple of things came up dur during the special edition production that I had not anticipated about having to do with this part. Uh, the first thing was they, that my, uh, my contract manufacturer for the special edition told me, hey, we can't get this part in China because, it's because of export restrictions. And I freaked out. Um, and then they said, oh, and also it's end of life. And, <laughs> and I freaked out twice. And uh, so it turned out that uh, one or more of the distributors had incorrectly identified this part in their catalog as being export restricted from the US. Uh, it has other parts in, in a, it's in a family of parts where other parts are export restricted and this one shouldn't be. And so I had to like, uh, I had to like sign paperwork saying that I was taking responsibility for this decision to ship it overseas and so forth, um, which was a little nerve wracking, but uh, it kind of made sense once once I figured out what was going on. And it really wasn't end of life. It, it had just been recently marked uh, not recommended for new designs, um, which means they're still manufacturing it. They just uh, are recommending that you that you go, you know the manufacturer of Texas Instruments is recommending that you look at other parts for brand new designs and well uh, it was kind of a new design at the time but but when I had designed this into my product a few months earlier it was not not recommended for new designs so I was kind of just at the edge of the of thing but I had no idea like how long it would be available uh, like maybe there would never be a second production of uber tooth one I hadn't I didn't know as it turns out I'm still buying CC 2400s in 2016 so uh, they're they're still out there but, uh, and they're still being manufactured. Uh, but I was pretty scared about this at the time. It seemed like a huge risk for uh, my venture. And um, the uh, uh, and then also, you know, I made these I made these special edition boards. Or I had them made for me then, after I managed to get the CC twenty four hundreds to China. And they came back to me, and I think about thirty of the one hundred worked. Uh, so. <laughs> So I had to sit down with a soldering iron and start fixing them. And uh, so I had to make like the 50 for my Kickstarter backers and then the 10 or 20 for the Australians. And, and then there were a bunch more that never got working and are like still sitting in a drawer. Uh, so uh, it was quite a task. I mean, the amount of effort I had to put into reworking those uh, was probably, I don't know, 30 or 40% of the amount of effort I would have had to do if I had just made them from scratch myself, uh, which maybe would have been a better choice uh, at the time. So I kind of learned my lesson about uh, just picking a random contract manufacturer online for small projects. Um, they did, you know, a pretty poor job of assembly and uh, and did zero testing, um, which at the time when I first hired them, I was just trying to get something done fast and I didn't really think about testing, even though I was thinking about testing for my main production. So uh, I started around that time. So after the, after the Kickstarter uh, pledge period was over, but before I shipped, during that time where I was getting manufacturing going and such, uh, I was uh, talking, starting to talk to people about maybe uh, reselling Ubertooth One after the Kickstarter because it seemed that there was enough interest in it uh, that it might be worth uh, keeping, keeping this product going and doing more than just a single production. And the first reseller that, uh, that contacted me was Hack5. Um, and uh, so Darren from Hack5, uh, if you may be familiar with the video series online, um, they're really into uh, education in the information security community, like helping helping new people get into infosec and uh, hacking. And so they were in the process of starting an online store. And he said, "Hey, we're going to be starting a store, and I think Ubertooth would be good to have in the store." And I said, "Yeah, that 
that's a good idea. Let's let's try to make that happen. And I thought, well, if I'm going to make that happen with Hack5, maybe I should have some other resellers too. And so the first one that I thought of, uh, the first reseller I thought of uh, to approach was SparkFun, uh, which is a, which is kind of a different target market. Uh, Hack5 targets folks in the InfoSec community and SparkFun targets folks in the electronics hobby community. And uh, SparkFun also happens to be uh, in my home state of Colorado. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm local to them and I met a couple of people there at the time. And um, I actually had taken a class there uh, on SMT soldering, uh, like solder paste stenciling uh, a few months prior. And so uh, I contacted... Um, uh, director of engineering at spark fund and said hey um i'm coming out with this thing do you have any interest in carrying it and they they kind of took a flyer on it i i it it doesn't it's kind of an unusual product for them because it's a bit expensive compared to other wireless development platforms of of comparable size and complexity that they carry uh but it sells well for them and i think that has to do uh with with the special function that it is capable of monitoring bluetooth devices so um uh, so that worked out and those two were my first resellers that i that i kind of got signed up uh and took orders from uh to start filling immediately after uh after the kickstarter units were sold so um meanwhile i was pretty excited about this whole Kickstarter thing being successful. And I was just incredibly grateful to my backers who had pledged uh, to support this project. And and uh, one thing that I, I decided to do uh, just just as an extra thank you was, uh, hey, I was I was putting this throwing star land tap kit together. So why don't I just give a free one to everybody who who uh, gets an Uber tooth? Um, because they're pretty low cost to manufacture, so uh, I could just kind of roll that into the into the package, no problem. So I actually had these things produced and had those available to sell to my resellers, e even though that it's a very low cost thing. It was nice to have, you know, two products in my catalog instead of one. And uh, and then I actually shipped these things, these packages uh, of uh, to my backers uh, in May of 2011. So. Uh, at the time, I thought like uh, my my pledge period for crowdfunding was basically the whole month of February, or kind of the end of January to the end of February, and then it took me until I think late May um, when I was able to ship, and I thought that I was way behind. Like this was um, like I really wanted to have to have shipped them sooner, uh, but as it turns out, you know, like. Uh, hardware project, crowdfunded hardware projects uh, it have a track record that's actually a whole lot worse than that in terms of de uh, delivering uh, in a timely fashion. So going from the end of February till the end of May was really not that bad at all, uh, especially considering that it was the first time I'd ever done volume manufacturing of anything. Uh, it it was pretty, uh, pretty successful uh, overall. And I think that a big part of why it was successful was because the version that I manufactured was identical to the version that I showed at ShmooCon. I made no changes. It was a bare, a bare board, um, and uh, it was functional. And the design, you know, I had already gone through a couple of design revisions. Uh, significantly, from UberTooth Zero to UberTooth One was a major revision. And when I got it working for ShmooCon, uh, I was done. I was like, okay, this is it. This is what I'm gonna ship. This is what I put on Kickstarter. And I didn't have to do any extra design or uh, changes to design uh, during the manufacturing process, which I think uh, I attribute maybe the, the speed of production uh, and delivery uh, primarily to that. So um, the, uh, the, the way that I kind of modeled how I would be bootstrapping this business is that I, I got like $50,000 from Kickstarter and that was enough to build a thousand Ubertooth ones and then have a little extra money uh, so that I could do things like throw in throwing star land tap kits and, um, and have a little buffer. And then uh, half of those had to go to my Kickstarter backers. Um, and then the other half were available to resellers. And so all the money from Kickstarter pretty much went into 
invent making inventory and then uh half of that inventory i was able to sell to resellers and then the money i got from those uh was enough to fund the second production of a thousand uber tooth ones and uh this this kind of worked this was this basically was how i bootstrapped the business and it meant number one it meant that i did not have to seek any kind of outside investment at all uh and that's super important uh i was and I was the sole owner of Grace Scott Gadgets, and I remain the sole owner of Grace Scott Gadgets. And that that's very important to me uh, because I can run the business the way I want to, uh, like having a having open source be such a high priority. So, um, but the, the uh, um, this process of, of bootstrapping, you know, it worked pretty well. But it it uh, you know it, the reality of cash flow is uh, you know a lot trickier. Then it kind of looks on paper like this. This is sort of a simplified, simplified view. Uh, but a, a really uh, another significant thing is the the pricing that I put on Kickstarter was close to the eventual retail price. I estimated what the retail price would be through resellers, and then I used that as my retail price or, or my Kickstarter price, and that really was important. Because uh, you know, I didn't just I didn't just collect enough money from Kickstarter to build the 500 Uber teeth that I needed for my Kickstarter backers. I got twice that, and um, at the, so that allowed me to bootstrap my business. It also was a fair price because uh, actually it was slightly less than what people later were paying for the same product through resellers, uh, and it was. Um, it kind of set an expectation of what the price of this product was. And, and I think that's important too. So uh, people often ask me, f especially in that first couple of years after this happened, people would ask me for Kickstarter advice a lot. Uh, people who were trying to launch their own Kickstarters and um, especially hardware projects because there weren't very many. Uh, Ubertooth was actually one of the earlier hardware projects that existed on, on Kickstarter. And it was at the time it was funded, it was the highest funded hardware project that had that had happened on Kickstarter. Uh, obviously, now they've you know gone through the roof, but uh, uh, but at the time it was quite the thing. And um, and so people kind of came out of the woodwork to ask me like, hey, uh, what do I need to do here? How do I need to price my product? And and um, do you have any advice for Kickstarter? And uh, I don't know. I probably gave some bad advice, but uh, uh, but one piece of advice that I kind of uh, kind of started thinking about and and continue to give to this day is uh, is to do contingency planning. Uh, do you and, and think about what will happen if you get funded to certain amounts? Like if you get funded to one dollar less than your pledge goal. How are you? How will you feel about that? Will you feel relieved that oh good, I don't have to go into production without proper backing? Um, that will be a good feeling to have. Uh, what if you get funded to one dollar more than your pre pledge goal? Will you be excited that you can do it, um, or will you be thinking, oh no, I should have asked for more? Um, think about uh, and it, what if you get. A thousand times your pledge goal. Uh, are you going to be screwed? Is there just like no way you could possibly handle that? Because um, all of these things are possible, and it's completely unpredictable. Well, maybe not entirely unpredictable, but you you, you must accept the fact that of uh, that any outcome could happen. And uh, and if you think through, uh, if you if you plan for the various contingencies for how how much funding you get. Uh, and then, um, then you that will help you to set your correct pledge level, and uh, maybe a, maybe a more concise statement is just to say set your pledge level to exactly what you need, no more, no less. Because if you set it too high, uh, you know people will look at that and think the uh, well they don't want to support this project because their aspirations are too lofty and. Uh, and if it's too low, you can get yourself in the pit of despair and so forth. So uh, 
as I said, I set mine probably too low, but I got lucky. Uh, and I, sh I should have set it up around 30K. I set it at 16K. Um, it turned out I got enough to make it work anyway. So then kind of that summer, I started uh, working on what might be Ubertooth 2. Uh, and this is a little prototype uh, board called Artichoke that uses a different chip instead of the CC2400 because I had no idea whether or not the CC2400 would continue to be available. Uh, as it turns out, uh, I have some prototypes of this board like sitting in a drawer that are still sitting in a drawer because uh, the CC2400 is still available, so I haven't felt a real uh, need to replace it even five years later. Um, but I started doing more electronic design, starting thinking about more projects and, and kind of how the future of Great Scott Gadgets would go, um, even though I was doing this on the side. But I was getting super busy, uh, especially as I started selling more units and getting more resellers and getting more support emails and so forth. Uh, and so uh, I ended up in July of 2011 uh, quitting my day job at the Boulder Labs. And this was a rather significant decision for me. Uh, you know, I had a I had a nice job working for the government doing research, which I love, and I was leaving it to uh, to dedicate my time to an open source hardware company. And the uh, I, I, I was basically forced into this decision by getting too busy with Grey Sky Gadgets. And I, I was working nights and weekends on Grey Sky Gadgets. And then during the day, during the week, I would go to my job at the Boulder Labs. And it was, it was becoming too much. And I was forced with the decision to choose one or the other. I, I had to decide I'm either going to stop doing Grey Sky Gadgets or I'm going to stop working at, at the labs and I decided to I decided to stop working at the labs and, and uh, give it a shot uh, as a business owner. So uh, at that time, I started kind of taking this business more seriously. Uh, obviously, I, you know, I, I had to take it more seriously because it had to become um, a steady living for for me. And the uh, one of the things that I that I thought of when I when I started taking it more seriously is that uh, maybe I needed a mission statement. And this seemed kind of weird to me at first because like uh, I'd been in companies where they would have some sort of a fluffy mission statement and it just it just seemed like bullshit to me. Um, and a lot a lot of times it is um, uh, like, for example, in the US, um, uh, publicly traded companies have a, a are actually required by law uh, to maximize their shareholder value. So whatever they tell you their mission statement is, their real mission is to maximize shareholder value. Um, and that they don't have a choice in the matter if they're a publicly traded company. Whereas I was a sole owner of my own company. And so I had the ability to choose whatever mission I wanted. And personally, that was extremely important to me. Um, and so I chose um, as a mission uh, that the mission of Great Scott Gadgets is to put exciting new tools into the hands of innovative people. And that putting tools into people's hands is, is, is the goal of the business uh, has been a guiding principle that has really helped me uh, on, at many occasions over the years. Uh, there have been all sorts of times when I've thought I've had an opportunity or uh, a business decision to make, and I could take the I could take the company in one or two one or two or more directions, uh, and uh, and I've been able to make that decision because I thought how you know which direction meets the the, the mission of the business uh, most closely. It's really helped me a lot. And, so, and, I, and I also kind of uh, wrote down some guiding principles to support this mission. And one of those guiding principles, kind of the number one guiding principle, is open source. That everything Grey Sky Gadgets ever does, hardware, software, content, whatever, everything we produce will be open source. And that, uh, that that is very important, that we can reach more people. We can put better tools into more people's hands um, by especially innovative people, who uh, many of whom appreciate open source and will, uh, and, and will take advantage of the benefits of open source, um, that, that we can reach more people uh, by, 
making everything we do open source. Uh, but we can also reach a, pe- a lot of people just by selling stuff, right? Like not everybody wants to buy things, uh, or sorry, not everybody wants to build things themselves. A lot of people just want to buy something that works. And so by, by doing both um, consistently, uh, we can reach the most people. And uh, also some other guiding principles to support the mission were uh, education, that, uh, that it's really important for the company to, uh, to produce educational resources and to support educational opportunities where, for people to learn how to new, use exciting new tools. Um, and uh, research and innovation, like I don't want to, I don't know, I don't want to spend my time and resources building something that somebody's built before. I want to build something new uh, that is innovative in some way that that meets a need that hadn't been met before, for example. And uh, and also, I uh, one of my guiding principles is just to be myself. Uh, I've I've seen certain companies like uh, small companies, solo companies, for example, that kind of put on an air of being bigger than than they really are. Um, and that always uh, that always looks kind of funny to me. And I decided early on that I was just going to deliberately just be myself and and my persona is tied to the business and just live with that and uh, be okay with being a one person company or a very small company uh, that is represented by, by me personally. Um, around this time, I think it was the first time I, I did a Google search and, did, and, and stopped uh, getting, did you mean Sabertooth? Uh, when I typed Ubertooth, uh, which I thought you know was a good sign that Ubertooth was a real thing once it stopped suggesting Sabertooth. Uh, and I started getting more and more emails from people like uh, idea people, who'd say, people who say things like, hey, I have this great idea for a product. I just need help bringing it to market, or I just need engineering, or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, generally, um, those people uh, don't really have a clue. Uh, like, they, they, um, there's a there's kind of a there's kind of a perception, and I could go uh, into this for hours, and, but I won't. But uh, there's kind of a perception among uh, certain folks that that like there's such that there's great value in an idea for a product or an idea for a project. And um, one of the things that I was realizing around this time was that, especially as kind of as I was getting approached by folks who wanted help with things, uh, was that that the uh, you know the value in an idea is really how much work you put into the implementation and uh, how much how much effort you put into building something and delivering it and uh, so the uh, so this was kind of kind of tied into my my concept of, of open source and and like um, sometimes people people ask me like okay so y- you don't do your own manufacturing and you don't do your own retail sales and you give away all your designs for everything you produce, like what, what do you have? Uh, and I think what we have at Grace God Gadgets is the effort that we put into our projects and the effort that we put into supporting our tools and to uh, promoting them and educating people about them. And that the more that we put into building open source hardware um, and software, uh, the more value there is in Gray Scott Gadgets. Like the more we give away, the more we get back. Uh, and that has really worked out uh, over time. Um, the uh, you know today we we have there are four of us working for the company not just one, uh, and we have a brand new lab that we just moved into and uh, you know we're still growing four years later. In fact, we went through a period of time or actually more than four years later we went through a period of time where like five years in a row we doubled revenue, which is kind of you know plenty of growth for me. Thank you very much. I don't really want to grow faster than that. Um, so my year my year ended. At TourCon 13 uh, in um, in 2011, uh, this particular year I'm talking about, and by this time, Crazy Guy Gadgets was you know a real thing. It was still a one-person company. Uh, I hadn't been able, you know, didn't have enough revenue to hire anybody yet, but I was able to keep pretty busy. Um, and one thing that I really kept busy with uh, at this particular time was I 
volunteered to design a badge, electronic badge for TourCon 13. Um, and the, the original conception here was that we would give all the attendees of TourCon an Uber tooth. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't really have the funding to make that happen. So we, we, we didn't, uh, you know, the Uber tooth, I tried the, really hard to try to s slim down the design to make it like the, the bare minimum cost to accomplish the Uber tooth function and, uh, and didn't really get to the cost, you know, the budget that we had available for an electronic badge. So I ended up making a, an electronic badge that had the radio chip, but didn't have the other stuff. And so it had a radio chip and it had a super low cost microcontroller, just the lowest cost thing I could possibly get and uh, a bunch of LEDs. And it did a 2.4 gigahertz spectrum analyzer function on the, across the LEDs, which was kind of cool. And then it had this other section that you could populate if you wanted to that would turn it into an Ubertooth. And making it modular like that, where like it would have one function, but then you could modify it to be this other function, ended up increasing the complexity a whole lot. Uh, and I had like two microcontrollers. I had to negotiate with each other about controlling the other thing. And like, it was ridiculous. I worked maybe six weeks for about 12 hours a day, seven days a week on this project, which was totally volunteer just for fun, just to give people at a conference. And like, from one standpoint, it was like, wow, how did I, and how did I waste that much time? But on the other standpoint, from, from, the, from the other point of view, um, it was actually a pretty rewarding experience because at that time in the life of Grace God Gadgets, I had quite a bit of time on my hands. Um, and also, some great things came out of it. Like, uh, the... Uh, uh, the person who won, I had a couple little contests. There was a badge hacking contest, and there, and then I also threw an Easter egg in there, and I had a contest for who could find the Easter egg. And people were doing things like uh, reverse engineering uh, binary from uh, a uh, microcontroller that had a CPU architecture that they'd never seen before, uh, and it was amazing. And uh, the person who ended up winning the badge contest was Mike Ryan, uh, who many of you may know now because he's kind of famous for his Bluetooth low energy research, uh, security research. And he won the badge hacking contest. And so as a prize, I gave him a fully populated badge that worked as an Ubertooth. And that was his first Ubertooth. And that's when he got started doing Bluetooth low energy stuff. And now he's gone on to do great things uh, for, for Bluetooth low energy security and awareness of it. And he's contributed back to the Ubertooth project a whole lot. So just that one person that I reached through this crazy badge project ended up kind of paying dividends long term. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so this was the uh, theory. Um, last thing to leave you with here is uh, kind of this is the theory of how the business was bootstrapped that year. But uh, this was the practice. Um, and like cash flow is hard. Uh, and uh, I've heard it said that you shouldn't really expect to make any money your first year in business. And looking back at that year, I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't really make any money. Uh, but I was able to create something that was sustainable and that met the mission that I set out for me. And financially, actually, the picture doesn't, is a little better than you see there because what is not represented there is inventory. And I started, of course, with nothing, and I ended the year with inventory on the shelf. So, uh, so it totally worked out. I was able to bootstrap the business, kind of following the the model that I that I set out when I did Kickstarter pricing and everything. And um, and now, you know, a few years later. We're still growing. We have more products. Uh, we're, you know, an order of magnitude plus um, larger in terms of revenue and everything else. Uh, and we're still, we're still striving to achieve our mission of putting, uh, you know, exciting new tools into the hands of people. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to uh, say that this this all worked out. And uh, that was my Uber Tooth year. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>